Okay, so we looked at uh, verses 1 to verse 4 in chapter 1 of 1 Timothy. And uh, we see what, uh, you know, how Paul uh, addresses himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then he's um, saying that he's an apostle by commandment. Uh, it's a command that he received from God. And we also, he talks about... Uh, God and you know he mentions about two persons of the Godhead God the Father and God the uh, Son okay and then we talk uh, about um, you know how he uh, encourages Timothy not to uh, heed to any false teachings and doctrines and also to tell the people and to be uh, uh, aware of what is being taught and to watch over what is being taught so even as um, you know uh, uh, we are part of the ministry team of our church or we are ministering. We also, it's important for us to watch over what is being taught to the people and what people are called to focus on. Uh, and we need to teach them the truth from God's word. And that is what is going to bring godly edification uh, and build up people in the faith. Okay. Uh, so we look at verses 5 to verse 7. Now, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, for which some have strayed and have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. Okay, now... Um, Paul is saying that what does God want from us? Okay, what is the purpose of the, now the purpose of the commandment? Okay, what is the meaning of this phrase? Uh, the purpose of the commandment is he's saying, what does God want from us? And he's saying basically God wants from us is love. And this love must flow out from a pure heart a good conscience and a sincere faith. Now, if you look, you know, uh, if, uh, if you read First Timothy and even Second Timothy, there are a lot of places, places that he is going to be talking about a good conscience. Okay, so we what we need to do to be focused, rather than straying away to all kinds of uh, teachings that are around us and what people are saying and what people are doing, if we need to be focused. Uh, then and we should and uh, if we need to be focused and not deviate from the core that means not deviate from the main truth into all unnecessary things then he says you need to have uh, you know a pure heart a good conscience and a sincere faith okay so what is the meaning of a pure heart here Pure heart means pure in your motives, not having any selfish interests or no personal uh, agendas. You know, um, sometimes when we are in church ministry, we can do things just to gain attention from people, to gain popularity or to, uh, to receive some uh, benefits from them, some perks from them, some gifts from them. But uh, Paul is here telling us that we need to serve God. Or even if you're coming to church to worship, we need to do with a pure heart. That means we need to be pure in our motives, why we're doing what we're doing, uh, why we're coming to church, uh, you know, why we're serving God, or uh, why are we ministering to people it should all be pure motives, no selfish agendas, no selfish uh, interests, and no personal um, agendas. The next thing he says is we need to have a good conscience. A good conscience means... A clear conscience. Now, what is conscience? What is conscience? Inner voice. Yeah, a conscience is our inner uh, voice. Okay, it's like um, you know when it's like a whistle that blows every time we do something wrong. You know, if you're driving uh, on the street and um, uh, you suddenly hear uh, the whistle, you know the policeman is trying to stop you. Or if you're playing a game and the referee blows a whistle, uh, you know you know you made a foul and everyone has to stop the game. And, uh, you know, uh, the referee will say what has happened and what should be done uh, going forward. Okay, so we know that we've done something wrong. So the conscience is like that 
whistle that just blows. Every time we do something wrong, think something wrong, say something wrong, um, you know, or see something that is not uh, right. Okay, so he says we need to have a clear conscience. Uh, that is, you know, clear conscience is when we live uh, uh, right in the sight of God and the sight of man. Okay, living right, doing what is right in the sight of God and in the sight of man. And the third thing he says is you need to have sincere faith. That means a genuine a faith, not a faith that is, uh, you know, a pretense or something that you just put on um, or something that you enact in front of people, but have a sincere faith. So as believers, you know, if we want to stay founded and grounded in the truth of God's word, in our foundations, uh, 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 in our walk with God, you know, then we, Paul saying you need to, and not stray away from uh, to false doctrines, he's saying you need to have a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith, okay? Uh, any questions or any doubts you have about uh, verses 1 to verse 7? Any comments? Can we move ahead? Okay, if there is no comments, no questions, then I'll move on to verses 8 to verse 11. Okay, verse 8 to verse 11, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Okay. So Paul is here saying that uh, we know that the law is good. No, God gave the law and the law is good because the law was intended to keep us from doing what is wrong. Or the law was like a signpost or a guide that showed us or told us when we miss God's standard or miss God's mark or what God has is requiring of us or when we are in the wrong. So the law is good and it was intended to keep us from doing what is wrong. Now, anything that says that, you know, people doing sins, that it's okay for them to do it. And here in this context, he's basically talking about the sexually immoral and those who practice homosexuality. Okay. Now, if you read, look at all of those sins that are, uh, are uh, uh, you know, given to us uh, in verse 10, uh, the in ESV, the English Standard Version, basically is saying that the sexually immoral or those who practice homosexuality. Um, you know, many of them were saying it's, uh, uh, in the church, we're saying it's okay for them to do it. They were entertaining this. Um, so, you know, while we're aware that we must stay away from all of these sins, uh, you know, uh, uh, and it's not okay for us to sin. Paul is drawing an attention to uh, a specific sins that is, he is mentioning in verse 10, where he's talking about the sexually immoral men uh, uh, and uh, people and men who practice homosexuality. So any kind of teaching that says that sexually, uh, sexual immorality or homosexuality is okay, Paul is saying is contrary to sound doctrine and is also contrary to the glorious gospel or it's contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's saying that we should not entertain this and we should not a compromise to these sins. And so we see that, you know, uh, these things have even crept into the uh, church and, um, uh, you know, pastors are okay with it. And, um, you know, uh, uh, and the church is not uh, opposing these things. And so these things are not okay. And these are sin in God's sight. And, uh, you know, we need to um, speak against this. We need to stop this if it's happening in our own churches. Okay, 
The next is in verses 12 to verse 17. Paul says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was ex exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am a chief. However, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me, first Christ Jesus, might show all long-suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now in these verses, Paul is reflecting on his own life and uh, calling. Okay, In verse 12, he says, you know, that uh, God has counted him faithful, putting him into the ministry. Okay, so what God looks for when he chooses us uh, to be his ministers or to minister in his kingdom, he is looking for uh, faithfulness. So God saw the faithfulness in uh, Paul and he put him into the ministry. And uh, we also know that God was faithful in helping and enabling and strengthening um, and in strengthening Paul to carry on the work that he had uh, wanted him to do. Uh, we see in verse 12 that, you know, uh, Paul is saying here that, uh, you know, God counted him uh, faithful and uh, put him into the ministry so what god looks for uh, when he chooses us for uh, to be in his kingdom or to serve him is he's looking for faithfulness and in verse 14 uh, you know uh, paul is saying that the grace of our lord was exceedingly uh, abundant uh, why does he say this because you know um, uh, paul is also mentioning that he was a blasphemer a pro prosecutor and uh, insolent man very stubborn arrogant uh, you know, and uh, he says he obtained mercy because he did this ignorantly and in unbelief, he obtained mercy from God. And uh, he's talking about God's uh, lavish grace and kindness towards him, no matter what he has done. And Paul is testifying to this uh, fact to this uh, truth okay so we know that even when we look into our past lives that um, you know uh, the depth of sinfulness that we were in and how God uh, you know showed his mercy and his kindness his grace he lavished upon us and he brought us out of um, uh, darkness into his marvelous light and um, you know bestowed his grace and his mercy and uh, uh, we are now children of the Most High God, and we're also in a position where He has seen us faithful, that He's called us to uh, serve Him. And we see that uh, Paul always, you know, uh, testifies about his salvation experience. In many places, he's always talking about this. He's always reminding himself about who he is and what God has done for him. In verse 15, he says, Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am a chief. And this is so amazing because even after all these years of great apostolic ministry, you know, Paul focused on the one main thing that is Jesus Christ came to save sinners and he calls himself the chief of sinners. You know, Paul is always um, uh, you know, establishing this fact that uh, you know, who he was, that he was a chief of sinners and God, how Jesus Christ saved him, uh, irrespective of all the things that he has done, you know, uh, the amazing things, the ministry that he has done, the places that he has gone, um, you know, the churches he's established, the young people that he's trained, um, and the, the churches that he's overseeing and overlooking, the amazing work that he's done. Uh, he does not, uh, you know, talk about about all of uh, his accomplishments, but he's always talking about his salvation experience, who he was, and how uh, Jesus Christ saved him. 
in verses 16 and 17, uh, you know, Paul says that what God did uh, is an example, is a pattern of his abundant grace and great patience. And why does he say this? This is to encourage others who believe in Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying, you know, um, even though I was in deep sin, you know, Jesus saved me and here I am, uh, you know, saved by his grace and just uh, uh, living in uh, the abundant grace and kindness that Jesus has lavished on me. He says, not only me, but, you know, all, uh, Jesus Christ will uh, shower his, uh, lavish his abundant grace and show his great patience to all those who uh, believe in him. And this is just to encourage the uh, the church at uh, uh, Ephesus and the, the other seven churches surrounding Ephesus, uh, and also to encourage Timothy. And then we see that, you know, um, uh, Paul is so overjoyed and uh, uh, excited at, uh, uh, you know, what God has done in his life and how he saved him. He breaks out into praise to God. He says, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible to God who alone is wise be honor and glory forever and ever amen okay so that is verses um, 12 to verse 17 anyone has any doubts on these verses anything you want to say no That uh, Paul is saying, I'm, I'm, I'm chief of the sinner, but the grace of God is now the minister of God. That's very uh, powerful truth. When we are in doing ministry, uh, when we walk into the salvation, always we should remember where we got saved and we have to thank to God. We have to always uh, proclaim in the salvation what how God has changed us. That is the true gospel when we are preaching and preaching to the people. That's what uh, yes, I think. Yes, true, Thomas. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yes, the true gospel that we are really sharing is our very lives. And uh, our very lives is actually showing the transformation power of God, the salvation power of God uh, in our lives uh, that has happened in our lives, that is taking place in our lives. And that is why the word also tells us that we need to work out our salvation daily, daily with fear and uh, trembling. Yes. Right. Thank you for sharing that. So we need to be mindful of um, not just where we are, the position that God has brought us, uh, how much he has blessed us, but we also need to be mindful of who we are and you know where God has God has brought us to and just be thankful and praise him. And you know, when we do that, we will also be considerate. We will also be gentle. We will also be patient with those who are, um, uh, are sinning. You know, uh, we see that uh, many of the people who were in Paul's team, you know, they deserted him. They uh, they uh, did things to bring him harm and danger. Uh, we see that many of the churches that he had planted, uh, you know, uh, were going away from the truth of what uh, he had taught them from God's word. It would have broken Paul's heart, but Paul never gives up on them. Still very patient. He's still very uh, gracious to them. So, yes, yeah, sometimes he comes hard on them, but he says it's because of his love for them, his care for them, uh, you know, and we see that the way he shepherds the flock, uh, the sheep that um, God has entrusted to his uh, care with great um, uh, responsibility, with great love, with great concern. And that's why he says, you know, night and day, I, I'm, I keep praying for all of you. You know, so burdened for the church, so burdened for the people. And that is why he's taking the time to uh, write uh, these letters, to encourage and you know, Timothy and Titus and uh, asking them what to do in their situation and encouraging the church as um, well. Yes. Anyone uh, would like to share any more thoughts? Okay, if not, uh, we will go ahead. Okay, we'll move on to verses uh, 18 to 20. Can somebody read verses 18 to 20, please? Okay. 
the 18 uh, 18 to 20 this charge i commit to you santhimoti according to the prophecies previously made that by them you may be may war wage the good warfare having faith and good conscience which some of have rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck of whom are hinamesis and alexander whom i delivered to satan that they may learn not to blaspheme Yes, thank you. So in verse 18, we see uh, Paul is uh, telling Timothy, make use of the prophecies spoken over your uh, life. Use them to fight the good fight. Use them in spiritual warfare against the um, enemy. Okay. So here uh, uh, it's an encouragement to him in his situation. He knows that, uh, you know, this young Timothy is uh, facing a lot of uh, uh, false teachers, doctrines, people who are arguing, uh, you know, also the elders of the churches who are trying to, uh, you know, much older to him, uh, who are trying to, um, uh, uh, you know, validate the false teachers and uh, the Jewish fables. So he's saying, you know, uh, use the prophecy spoken over your life, declare it, remind yourself of it. And, uh, you know, use that as weapons to fight against uh, uh, every force of evil and darkness that is coming against your ministry and against the uh, uh, churches. And so, you know, Paul refers to these prophecies again later on in his letter in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, and 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse uh, 6. In verse 19, once again, is a reminder to hold on to faith with a good conscience. Okay, so I, I said, I told you that, you know, Paul uh, keeps on using this word good conscience throughout this letter and also elsewhere in 2 Timothy. So uh, I said that a good conscience is simply living right before God and um, man. It says, if you do away with God, good conscience uh, and do things that conscience says that are wrong, then he says you will shipwreck your own faith and destroy your own faith. So he says, you know, yes, there are many things that are going around wrong, wrong teachings, uh, false teachers around you, but, you know, don't do away with your good conscience of knowing what is right and wrong and holding on to what is right and doing away with what is wrong. If you give in to these wrong teachings and uh, uh, wrong teachers, then you, it will make a shipwreck of your faith and destroy your own faith. And then he brings about an apostolic judgment on Hymenius and um, Alexander. Now Hymenius is also mentioned again in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 17 uh, where he's mentioned uh, in connection with uh, Philetus uh, who was a very dangerous man. Uh, Paul mentions him as a dangerous man. Now uh, this uh, Hymenius, you know, he was promoting a doctrine uh, that the resurrection was passed already. Okay, that means the, the resurrection of the dead of those who have already died is already passed. Um, and uh, he says this and he mentions about this and this is a false teaching. So Paul is telling him, uh, you know, uh, telling Timothy uh, to be careful of Hymenaeus and uh, he's... Um, bringing about an apostolic judgment. I'll just tell you what is the judgment that he brings upon him. Uh, before that, we look at um, uh, Alexander. Alexander here, uh, you know, is a coppersmith. Uh, he's um, mentioned uh, in uh, Second Timothy was... Uh, chapter 4 verse 14 and uh, there he's mentioned as someone who did much evil to Paul um, and it's possible that it's the same Alexander that uh, Paul is mentioning here in first Timothy chapter 1 now Paul is saying uh, you know hand over these men uh, you know he says I've handed over these men to Satan that they may learn not to uh, blasphemy. Now, if you look at these words, it can be a really strong word to say, how can uh, Paul, or what authority or what right has he uh, to hand over these men to uh, Satan? Now, Paul uh, mentions something similar to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 
verse 5 and we need to understand uh, this as um, you know Paul uh, excommunicating these uh, uh, people from church okay that means he's putting these people out from the fellowship of the church and once he puts them out of the fellowship of the church they are no longer under the spiritual uh, oversight of the church leadership or they're not under the spiritual covering of God or under the spiritual uh, protection of God and uh, once they are out they are prone to uh, Satan attacking them uh, Satan causing a lot of confusion, harm, danger, bringing about sickness and difficulty in their life. And Paul is uh, uh, doing this so that, you know, when they are excommunicated from the church and when they are uh, out without any spiritual covering or protection, what would happen to them is when they go through all this suffering, uh, sickness, pain, difficulties, brokenness, then they will come to a realization of what they have done is wrong or what they have done was wrong and that can lead them back to repentance going back to god and asking god for forgiveness and uh, and we see in in, uh, in other letters paul says take take this person back because he has changed so the whole uh, idea behind this is not just to lead them to satan so that satan can destroy their life and they can land up in hell for eternity but uh, the idea is so that these men when they're uh, out of the spiritual commu uh, you know protection or covering uh, or the oversight of the church leadership or the covering and protection of God himself, then, you know, they're open and more prone to the attacks of the evil one and they can realize what they've done is wrong and they can, you know, uh, come back in repentance. And when they do, you know, uh, the church uh, can receive them uh, back. Okay. So this is um, uh, the end of uh, this chapter. Uh, and our key takeaway verse is verse 5 and verse 19 where it says we must live uh, and must love out of a pure heart, a good conscience and sincere faith. If I do away with a good conscience, do things that my conscience says wrong, I will make a shipwreck of my faith and destroy my own faith. Okay, so this is end of chapter 1. Um, any doubts, any comments, anything you would like to say? No, if not, uh, can we move on to chapter 2, please? Yeah, so can uh, we read chapter 2? There are about 15 verses, so maybe three of us, three of you all can read uh, five, five verses. So can some somebody read verse 1 to 5, then someone else can read 5 to uh, 10, and somebody else from verse 11 to 15. First of all, then I urge that petition, prayer, request, and thanksgiving be offered to God for all people, for kings and all other who are in authority, that we may live a quiet and peaceful life with all reverence towards God and proper conduct. This is good and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to know the truth. For, for there is one God, and there is one who brings God and mankind together, the man, Christ, Jesus. Thank you, Erin. Can somebody read from 6 to verse 10, please? Six. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. He is the message of God gave to the world as does the right time and i have been chosen a, a preacher and a apostle to teach our gentiles this message about faith and truth i am not in in engraving just telling the truth it in every place of worship i want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to god freedom anger and the controversy and I want women to be uh, modest in their appearance. They should wear decent and appropriate clothing and not draw attention to themselves by the way they fix their ears, by the wearing gold or the pearls and 
expensive clothes for women who claim to be a devo- devote devoted to god should make themselves attractive by the good things they do thank you kiran can somebody read from verses 11 to 15 please Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, and love, and holiness with self-control. Okay, thank you. Just take uh, a couple of minutes just to go through this uh, chapter again, and then maybe uh, like we did for chapter one, each of you can take a minute to just share something that really impressed your heart, uh, something that the Holy Spirit really communicated, something, uh, some words that really stood out for you, and we can just take one minute to share. Okay, so we'll just take uh, one or two minutes to just. Look at it again, and then maybe each of us, each of you, can take turns to share. Yeah. Ah. Uh, yeah, ma'am. Hello. Yes, Adam. Yeah. Ah. Uh, yeah. From chapter, from verse one to four. Uh, whatever I've understood from this passage is that, um, I think this is talking about uh having a good character as a leader, because uh you know our character really matters uh you know a lot to someone out there because uh, see suppose if we are you know uh, preaching about love. And if if we don't act or if we don't show love to someone else, uh, it doesn't matter a lot. So uh, yeah, to save someone and to bring out someone from uh uh yeah uh, so so uh, so uh yeah so to uh to to save someone uh and to bring someone out from uh, from the lost things uh. So, uh To save them from yes. the sin, uh, yeah, and uh, into uh, into Jesus yeah. Christ, yeah. So, so, uh, yeah, this uh, our character really matters a lot. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay. So, sorry. Thank you, Erin. No problem. So, thank you for sharing that. Yes, important that uh, you know, as leaders, um, we live peaceable lives. Uh, in all godliness and reverence, it's our life that matters, our life that talks, uh, and the life that of love that uh, will cause others to turn to Jesus. Anyone else who like to share? Everyone can just take a minute to share. Yes, Dave. Okay, quickly. Uh, we all need to just take a minute to share. Here in uh, first saying- words. Okay. Here in first words, uh, Paul is saying, therefore, exhort first of all, supplications and prayers, intercession. He's encouraging us to do intercession prayer and uh, be thankful for all the. Uh, People. That's what he's saying. Uh, many, uh, people who are doing serving in the Christian life, we are supposed to intercession. We do the intercession for the authorities, leaders, and for all the people. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And in times that we are living in, you know, we need to really pray for our church leaders for wisdom, guidance, because there's so many uh, new things that uh, and wrong teaching and doctrines that are creeping into the church. 
many sins that have been accepted and said it's okay. Uh, you know, uh, it's very sad to see that. So we need to pray for churches. We also need to pray for people because many of them around us are suffering um, with this, this pandemic. Uh, and I think, yes, supplications, prayers, and sessions very, very important at this time for the believers, uh, for the people. Especially for, uh, especially for the churches also. Because of the pandemic and lockdown, people are stopped uh, attending the churches. This case of there and pastors are suffering to take the church forward. And there's a culture where people sit and relax on uh, online services and things and all happening. So many issues are there to pray. This situation is going very critical. Yes. True, yes. People have got so comfortable, you know, sitting at home and not going to church and online. And yes, just pray that there'll be a more revival in the church. So this revival will spread out, that many people will know uh, Jesus Christ uh, even before he comes back soon. Okay, anyone else? Yes, ma'am. I was. I was yeah. Yes, Dave, uh, I'll request you to please increase your volume because we really won't be able to hear you then. I'm, I'm, at, I'm at the loudest. Oh, okay, okay, fine. Uh, so verse 5 and 6, uh, I was saying that we as, as a leader and a pastor, we are supposed to be uh, like a mediator that Jesus did between God and man. Sometimes in, in, uh, even in the, the New Testament ages as we are, um, Sometimes we some some believers and some people might find it difficult to relate and uh, communicate, and we have to we as a leader and pastor we should we have that role to be a mediator between God and and some of our men. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So it's talking about uh, verse uh, five, where we need to be mediator between uh, God and man, stand in the gap. Uh, intercede for people yes that's so important cry out to god for them uh, you know uh, cry out for the for the lost who have not yet known him uh, so yes we need to be mediators thank you for sharing that anyone else yes ma'am 9 to 9 to 15 here is uh, paul is teaching us like some manner for women and the men being a simple life and be simple uh, outside also and inside be simple and some uh, something some guideline is there so it's very nice yeah, thank you okay guidelines for women okay uh, uh, to be simple okay but uh, god is looking for more of godliness godly women uh, and not just uh, our good works. Yes. Okay. Prince and Kanan. Yeah. In um, yeah, verses nine to fifteen, I am also uh, saying the same thing. And uh, what my thought was, uh, it also uh, suits for uh, men because these days uh, men's also wearing some, yeah, very worse dresses. So it also suits for uh, men also. Okay, so you are uh, uh, going with uh, Kiran and saying not just women but also men. Okay, uh, to dress appropriately in a manner. And also live lives that are holy, pleasing, and acceptable to God. Okay, Prince? Yeah, ma'am. Mm. So, uh, Jesus is the only way to salvation. So, so verse says, uh, 6 says that uh, who gave himself a reason for all. So, God uh, planned that all men, uh, every, everybody should be a uh, get salvation that's that's why he gave uh, to jesus for us and like uh, before uh, in five says that uh, he is a mediator it's like we also need to mediate for the unsaved people okay thank you so uh prince is pointing out to verse uh, six where it says it's uh, you know uh Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all. 
okay and um, uh, so he's saying that um, you know uh, Jesus is the only way for salvation um, and at the right time God brought about this salvation plan and Jesus accomplished it and uh, you know with, and also pointing out to verse 5 that you know we need to stand as mediators between God and man intercede for uh, men and women okay Neelam Okay, if uh, okay, we'll uh, look at um, you know the explanation verse by verse and uh, look at more details of each word uh, in this chapter uh, in the next class. So we'll end class now. Okay, thank you all for joining. Have a blessed day and um, see you all at next uh, for the next class. Thank you. <laughs>